If you rummage around in your memories, there is probably that one special game. One game that not only was highly playable, but more importantly, one that rewired your brain as to what games can achieve, what stories can be told, what emotions evoked. Simply something that has shown you that games are not just brainless entertainment as many to this day perceive it to be. For you or many different people, that can be different games. I myself found that game when I was a teenager and all subsequent titles were viewed by me through the lens of that one game. I invite you now to take a look at what that game was. Together, let's take an in-depth look at Planescape Torment. And the spoiler warning for this game goes right at the start, because it's one of the very few games that should be gone into absolutely blind. So, if you haven't played it and want to experience it for yourself, here is your warning. If you played it or don't care for spoilers, feel free to listen along. Oh, and like, comment, subscribe and share this video. YouTube isn't pushing my vids that much, so any help would be appreciated. Oh, and there are two things I would like to share with you. First off, I will try to keep the community tab on YouTube for my channel up to date so that you will know what I'm doing and what my next project will be. And secondly, I set up a Twitter or X account, so you can catch me there. The link is in the description. Planescape absolutely was and still is a very unique game, with very well-known mechanics when it comes to the gameplay, but with a fresh and interesting approach to storytelling. It is, in fact, the same rule set as all the Infinity Baldur's Gates and Icewind Dales, the combat and spell casting is calculated and executed in pretty much the same way. So there are no big surprises here. The barebone mechanics were immediately understandable for anyone who played these games before. And that includes me for that matter. So why is it that even taking into account these surface level similarities, this game still managed to throw me for a loop? That's simply because the mechanics of AD&D have nothing to do with this game's core strengths. Although the lore of AD&D has very much to do with it, and in major ways to be frank. But the dice rolling, slashing and casting part of it isn't ultimately that important. Yes, it happens from time to time and can be great fun, especially when you play a mage because the spell animations are to this day breathtaking and way more imaginative than any other of the Infinity Engine games. But this time, the one and only king is the narrative, and everything else bows to it and is subservient to it. I even would go as far to say that this game would be as enjoyable even without any combat encounters. You see, I myself many times treated the fights here more as mandatory or accidental pests rather than a challenge. Don't get me wrong, there is fighting if you are searching for it, and even some areas strictly dedicated to just that. But you can as well run past most of these, and your enjoyment of the game probably wouldn't diminish. I know my didn't. The first odd thing that I was not prepared for is how the game starts. Well, waking up on a slab in a mortuary isn't exactly something I would call common, unless you tend to party too hard. Just after I woke up, a skull approached me and started talking. Furthermore, it seems that my hero doesn't remember a thing. At this moment, I started to suspect that this isn't your typical run-of-the-mill hero story. Oh, and I will get back to that skull, don't worry. Mort is his name and he is one of the available companions, but I will hold off talking about him till the moment I talk about all the other companions, which will happen further along in the video. But the deviations from the norm didn't start here, they started right after I selected New Life in the main menu. I was conditioned by Baldur's Gate and Icewind Dale, or many other RPGs for that matter, how the character creation screen should look like. In this case, it was a bit off. You see, you don't choose the character's class, this is set to warrior at the beginning. You don't choose how the PC looks like or what his name or gender is. You are a male warrior, zombie lookalike, and there is nothing you can do about it for now. Later, you can switch classes. The one thing that you can influence are your character's attributes. You can distribute the points freely to a max of 18 here and later in game to 25, after leveling up that is, because each level gives you one additional attribute point, which was mightily strange, seeing how important they are in a normal D&D campaign. But for this game it makes sense and I will explain why in a bit. Firstly, let's finish up with the stats. There is no new attribute here, but some are ridiculously more important than others. There are two that reign supreme for the entire game, and those two are wisdom and intelligence. They allow you to find solutions to in-game problems and riddles. 
as well as to facilitate remembering things that the nameless one forgot, which gives a ton of experience from beginning to the end of the story. The rest of the abilities are basically dumb stats, with dexterity and charisma giving some advantages, and strength and constitution for me personally are virtually useless. Yeah, I know that they do have their obvious uses, like more HP, bigger damage or a greater carrying capacity, but these are things that don't concern me that much, as soon enough I will play as a mage. So now let me explain why I said that gaining one attribute point each level makes sense in this game. I soon found out that my nameless hero is in fact immortal. You can stab him, clobber him to death or magic missile him and he will come back to life each and every single time. Barring some rare occasions when a powerful being decides to get rid of him. In that case he will simply cease to exist rather than die. But as I said, these instances are extremely uncommon. Still, there is a catch to that. After each death up until now, he woke up without remembering a thing. This is something that changes this time, as now, as soon as I took control, the deaths that the Nameless One suffers from no longer reset his memory. There is no telling how many lives the Nameless One lived before I took control over him. Although it is strongly hinted that he died and rose from the dead for many thousands of years. So leveling up for him isn't the case of gathering new experiences, but more often than not remembering old ones, giving him a much bigger boost in the form of an attribute point, signifying the fact that he is regaining his old abilities rather than learning new ones. That makes him vastly different than any other hero roaming the Forgotten Realms. As for most others, their ability scores are, for all intents and purposes, set in stone. At least that was the case in this version of D&D. But back to the situation at hand. Let's gather my bearings and figure out what is going on. I know that I was dead and came back to life. And I know that I'm in a mortuary run by the Dustmen, a faction in Sigil. Sigil is the city that I found myself in after escaping that lovely establishment I woke up in. It's the City of Doors, sort of a crossroad for all planes of existence in the Forgotten Realms. Whether it be the Celestial Plains or the Nine Hells, they all meet here. They do in some way or another find their way here via a more or less direct connection. Each doorway, each archway, each simple alcove can contain a portal to a different plane. Some have obvious keys, like a certain passphrase or an object, other can only be accessed by thinking a thought or even feeling a specific emotion. Simply put, each and every plane has a connection to Sigil. That means that this is the place where you can find and even chat with demons or other denizens of the planes that in other, more maybe traditional campaigns would be simply, most of the time, enemies or summons. And no, they don't change their nature here, for the most part. That means that demons will still be chaotic evil and devils lawful evil, but they will behave to some extent in this city. It was absolutely mind-boggling to me why they didn't attack me on sight, as they did in so many other D&D games to then slowly realize that this setting is governed by a different set of rules. A set of rules that is enforced by a being called the Lady of Pain, a powerful entity that watches over Sigil. She is not a god, not exactly, but most definitely on par with them. Some speculate that in the city itself she is even more powerful than any other being. But that isn't the topic of this video. The one important thing to remember is that she watches over everything here and is, in fact, the final arbiter if someone causes too much mayhem. She will either imprison that person in a labyrinth, or if that doesn't help, she will erase that existence altogether. Oh, and yes, she can destroy the Nameless One. I know that I sound very exposition-y right about now, but there are some concepts that I need to get out of the way sooner rather than later, and it will make some events in this game more clear as time goes on, so please bear with me. After I left the mortuary, the next objective is to locate Farad, a local entrepreneur one might say, one that operates a business that finds dead bodies, takes almost everything of value from them and then sells them to the dustman. And seeing as people always die, it really is a steady source of income. As to how I know that I need to find them, well, that information was written on the nameless one's back, like some sort of a to-do list or not to-do list, well, a checklist of some sort. Who left it there is yet unclear, but this is the only actionable lead as of now, so I will try and find this Farad guy. But before I do that, I want to change my class, because playing Planescape as a warrior is rather underwhelming. 
And you might ask me why that is, when I already mentioned that the fights in this game are rather unimportant and mostly skippable. You see, there are two reasons for that. Firstly, there still is some combat, and blasting enemies with magic is way more fun than standing by and watching, while the nameless one frantically swings and repeatedly misses. <sighs> it still is D&D. And secondly, and far more importantly, the narrative in many places rewards you for playing a mage, in ways that almost never happens for the other two classes. You can learn way more playing as a user of arcane knowledge, so that is what I will do. Plus, how you become a mage in the first part of the game is my absolute favorite way of becoming one in any game that I played to date. To do that, I go to Mabet, an old woman living in Ratpika's square. She can teach the nameless one how to become a mage, but before she does that, she has a few errands to run. Errands that are basically fetch quests, but the story, or rather lessons behind them are fascinating. Mabed uses these tasks to impart to the hero something about the arcane arts, without him becoming an actual wizard. Yet, the first time around I ate up all that she had to impart. Her first ask was especially interesting. She gave you a seed and sent off to the market to procure more of it, but no one there had what I needed and the only one who could help me was a guy that weeped for trees in a nearby district. He guided me along a path that allowed the nameless one to concentrate on the seed and believe it to sprout. And amazingly, it did, covering the hero's entire arm. Both the nameless one and that guy panicked somewhat at that point as the plant wasn't letting go. But after returning to Mabet, she told me how to get rid of it. Funnily enough, it was the same way as making it sprout. The protagonist just had to believe that it would fall off, and it did. Little did I know how important that little tidbit was to the entire story. To be honest, I still eat up every dialogue line pertaining to this quest each time I play this game. The bottom line is that she cautions the player to be careful when dealing with magic. She tells him that there is always something new to learn and not to get complacent. Spells are a tool, that much is true, but letting it run rampant and unchecked is an unimaginable danger. What is even more interesting is that her words of caution reverberate through the entire game, even way later in the narrative. For example with Ignis, a potential companion that we will talk about later. Or how a careless bit of magic intended to mend a terrible evil created yet again countless more horrors. It honestly felt that I was together with the Nameless One, learning something not only about the mechanics of magic, but also a bit of the metaphysics present in the planes, a little peek behind the curtain, if you will, that allowed me not only to be more proficient with spells and what the very real dangers are if utilized recklessly. It's a short but very memorable quest, one that stayed with me for all these years since I first played this game. One that comes back to me each time I think of Torment, and that is saying something, taking into account how many memorable moments are in this game. Now that I finally became a mage, it's time to find Ferret, whose compound is not that far from here. I take a fistful of junk, toss it into an archway and find his palace. This weasley old fart knows something about the Nameless One's past and where they found his body, but won't tell you. Not without completing a small task for him as payment. I had to simply find the bronze sphere that is somewhere beneath the city and bring it to him. This quest isn't as easy as it seems though, as it involves quite a long trek through the sewers and a few combat encounters. But I did find it and brought it back with me. Admittedly, this quest in itself is pretty straightforward, but at this point in the game it only adds to the mystery of who you are and what is going on. Still, no answers, only a long adventure in some dark crypts. And I for one love it, especially that there are some few chosen interesting things down there, like the flask of infinite water or an undead community with one zombie or ghoul that can teach the nameless one how to talk with the dead. Quite useful. I can't even properly describe how I felt down there, unsure of what is going on but determined to find out more, battling rats, bats and crocodiles to get a little bit further. And the rats have an especially interesting design. These are called cranium rats. Each one separately is rather weak, just like a simple rat. But when there are more of them, these nasty little rodents become capable of casting some high level spells that can sting quite a bit. I love these enemies, fighting them and how they operate is fascinating to me. Not least of all that they actually correctly program their behavior into the game. But back to the adventure in the sewers and tombs. It simply felt like a mystery wrapped in intrigue with some secrecy sprinkled on top. You can even find an arm that once belonged to you. 
and get some useful tattoos of it back in Sigil. There is also a rather interesting tomb that seems specifically made for the Nameless One. You have to die in it a couple of times to get to the center. And I don't mean that there are traps that will kill you if you are not careful, but rather that you have to intentionally trigger them to get forward. It is very concretely, specifically made for an immortal, made for the Nameless One. But as to who made it or why it was constructed is still unclear. This adventure in the catacombs was exactly the place where I finally understood that I shouldn't concentrate on the combat and basic gameplay mechanics in this game. You see, once a pack of rats killed me for the 10th time, the hero simply woke up again at the entrance to the level and I could try again. This is when it hit me. There is no real danger of me losing any fight. Ultimately, when I die I will get back up and have at it. So there is no real tension when it comes to the combat, no stakes in getting defeated. And this is when I got what Planescape actually wanted from me. It wanted to interest me in taking a closer look at the narrative. To actually listen to the NPCs that I met and will still meet along the way. And think about it. Not in a surface level, oh, there is the bad guy and you have to defeat him. But rather, why am I doing what I'm doing? Who the Nameless One really is and what happened to him and why? It wanted from me to concentrate on the feelings the story evoked in me what memories it conjured up. As I got older, these feelings and images changed, became deeper as I found meaning in things previously unimportant. As life molded me, so the torment reflect different things back to me. It was like the nameless one remembering things, just this time with my own memories serving as the backdrop. The loss I experienced, the hardships, the small little deaths that each and every one of us suffers from. Whether it be the loss of a loved one, unrequited love or a broken promise that cuts way too deep. This was the first game that basically posed some existential questions to me, that treated me more seriously than other games, and it hit the right spot. From this point forward, I was fully invested and determined to get to the bottom of it all. Funny how taking the emphasis of the default mode of gameplay in any CRPG lets you focus on other aspects. Like, what does this whole adventure really mean to the Nameless One? And more importantly, to you. As I said, I found the bronze sphere and brought it back to Farad. As it turns out, he implied that he knew more than he actually did. He doesn't really know who the Nameless One is or what he really was after. But at least he could show me the place where he found the hero's body. Well, Farad's daughter will show me that place. It happens to be an alley that wants to grow and change, which is weird, but something that I will gladly facilitate, thus opening new areas to explore. We still are in Sigil, but in a completely new district. And just like waking up in the mortuary, with no clues as to what to do now or even any direction as to where to go. At least at the beginning I had the words written on the nameless one's back. But this is rather deliberate on the devs part. Firstly, it incentivized me to explore, but much more importantly, it compounded the feeling of confusion and a very real sense of being lost. And as I tried to remember where to go next, I wandered around aimlessly, trying to get a grip on my surroundings and what to do. In this instance, it was as if I stepped into the shoes of the Nameless One a bit too much. Although this sense of bewilderment and confusion isn't the case if you have Mort in your party as you leave the alley and enter the new area, as he will be abducted by some overgrown rats and brought to Lothar, a rather powerful wizard, so powerful in fact that he can destroy the Nameless One, wiping his existence off the face of the realms. The important part is that he can tell you something about what to do next and who made you immortal. The one responsible was Ravel Puzzlewell, a night hack. These are pretty detestable creatures, cruel and sadistic, not someone that I would normally like to meet. But finding her is the next objective. Lothar directs the Nameless One to the next area where he finds out that Ravel was banished by the Lady of Pain to a labyrinth, but also how to get to her. Which involves finding Ravel's descendant, taking some of her blood and producing a physical portal. And I know that I brushed over this section of the story, but it really involves a bit of running around and a lot of information dumps. Exposition, that's true, but they don't really feel that way. Although there is another reason why I glossed over it. That's because these two areas contain a lot of non-mandatory stuff that is phenomenal and well worth a look. And the first thing I will talk about is the public and private sensoriums that are found here, as they pertain to the story in a rather major part. 
The Synsites, one of the factions in Sigil, have a building here, something called a Sensorium. Inside there are some rather strange stones. The establishment itself is divided into two parts. One is available to the public, the other is not. But the important part are the stones themselves. These function somewhat like a television. By touching it one can relive a moment in time that someone decided to commit to that stone. But it is done from the perspective of the person living that very moment. And most importantly, you not only see what that someone saw, but also feel it. Each solitary emotion, or a cacophony of conflicting thoughts. Everything that person was feeling at the moment it was committed to the stone. Whether it be mind-numbing boredom listening to the most boring lecture in the plains, the tenderness of a first kiss, the pounding heart of a true love, or devising strategy for an entire army by a general. All available stones can stir something inside the memories of the Nameless One. Each memory having a parallel in his own countless lives, that allow him to remember a bit of his past. And while it is fun to relive these gathered memories, the most important ones are in the private part of the sensorium. All of them, in a very concrete way, pertain to the Nameless One and are fantastic to read through. You can't even imagine what I felt the first time when I viewed and lived those memories. Here I was, not sure where to go next or what to do, and from these stones came forth memories that tried to send me a message, trap me and finally utterly destroy me emotionally. First off was the message that Ravel, the night hag I was looking for, left for the Nameless One. She used a random sensate, and by used I mean that she mutilated him horribly, cutting off his legs, arms and gouging his eyes, just so he could remember her voice and go back to his faction and commit these memories to a stone. And through this memory, Ravel is able to communicate with the Nameless One and give him pointers on how to reach her. With this interaction, two things became immediately obvious. One, the hack isn't exactly banished, she's rather hiding in a place that is hard to reach, but I gathered that already. And secondly, she is immensely cruel and unspeakably evil. She will commit any atrocity if it furthers her goals, whatever they may be. However, the use of a sensory stone to communicate is absolutely genius. Because they are more or less available to the public. Sure, the access to this particular one is gated behind the membership with the sensates, but it's a rather safe bet that during the Nameless One's search for his lost memories, he is bound at some point to be using stones that quite literally store them. So the possibility was rather high that a fair share of incarnations would sooner or later find their way to this particular stone. And no other than the Nameless One could experience the deeper memories, and for all intents and purposes, talk would ravel. So the message was actually very secure, hiding in plain sight, on the other hand, no one besides the hero would find that information useful anyhow, unless someone else was actively searching for Ravel, which might actually be a possibility when I think about it. Then perhaps it's a good thing that she hid it as deviously as she could? Well, it doesn't matter. The one thing that I am to this day wondering about is how many incarnations stumbled upon this stone and had this exact same conversation with Ravel. We probably will never know. Secondly, there is the trap that one of the Nameless One's previous incarnations left in one of the stones. This particular one sees all other incarnations, whether they come before or after him, as body thieves. So he decided to set up this trap to imprison the mind of anyone who tried to take his place, to take away who he is. But he can be convinced to let the current Nameless One go, or if you can't convince him, he will do so of his own accord if bombarded by unrelenting questioning. He cannot stand to be trapped alone with someone who can see him all the time and pesters him with unending questions. He will free the protagonist out of sheer terror that he would have to spend an eternity together with someone who not only is always there, but is always questioning him. Sure, he wanted to trap and hurt the other incarnations, but not to be present for it. He wanted peace, not questions. For now I will leave it at that, as I will go into more detail about these incarnations and the others near the end of the story. And thirdly, there is the one bit of storytelling that left me utterly emotionally floored, even now playing the game for the nth time. In the private sensorium's last sensory stone, there is a memory from a woman named Dionara, a name I know all too well, but up until now I did not mention it. You see, I met her right at the start of the game in the mortuary. Her grave is located there, her ghost haunts it. And if she wanted to see the Nameless One again, the bottom floor of the mortuary is probably the best place to do that. I spoke to her, I tried to remember, but very little came of it. 
she certainly knew the protagonist. And here, in this stone, is the one memory she left behind. The recollection of her sincerity and love for the hero, her devotion. But there is more to this memory than just that. It tells of a time when the Nameless One tried to convince her to come with him somewhere. And in that somewhere, she lost her life. She sacrificed herself for him and he doesn't even remember that sacrifice or the severity of what he did to convince her. Because to me, to the hero, to the incarnation that was contemporary to the Yonara, she was just a useful tool to be wielded and then discarded. The genius of this scene is that you feel both sides of the exchange. You feel what the Yonara felt, how deep her devotion was, but also how the Nameless One felt. How you felt. How the protagonist was utterly devoid of any genuine affection or even sympathy for the person across of him. In fact, you feel the bottomless disinterest and contempt for the Yonara that that incarnation felt. The frustration when things didn't went his way. It's such a clever bit of storytelling that it left a lasting impression in a story that is full to the bursting of memorable moments and writing. When I think about it, there are not only two sides to that sensory stone story, but three, or even four. There is of course that incarnation and the Yonara, but also the current one, who, as a side note, is actually disgusted with himself for what he did, a spectator that in a very concrete way was responsible for what happened. He knew full well what would occur, but was utterly unable to prevent it witness to an unavoidable tragedy, without any means to stop it. And then there is the player, you, me, whose perception of the Nameless One changes due to that little story encased in a sensory stone. That now long lost incarnation fully intended from the very beginning to lead the Anera to her doom. She was supposed to die on the mission they embarked on. That was her explicit purpose, a disposable tool in every way. The protagonist was an awful person, one too many times, and it will come back around in the story a couple more. But the Onara herself was only part of the team that that incarnation put together. There were three other, and two of them I will talk about in a bit. But let's shine a small spotlight on the last one for a brief second. Mostly because there isn't much to talk about. This one was named Zachariah. He is rumored to be an expert marksman, his arrows supposedly never missed which was interesting because he was blind and couldn't see much of anything, although it is said that he aimed using other methods. He is dead now, his body is in the mortuary, serving the dustman in his undead. When I found him, it was only worth a bit of experience, not much more. But this surface description would make him an ideal candidate for the Nameless One's current party, especially that there aren't that many party characters that can use projectile weapons. There is one to be exact. Apart from Ignis, but he doesn't use a weapon, so there is that. Although the party members we did get are also fascinating, so there isn't much loss there. Even if I would love to know Zachariah a bit better, as it is now, he only serves to illustrate that the Nameless One left a whole army of dead, well-meaning people in his wake. Now let's push the story along a bit further before I talk about all the companions in the game. And we are still not done with this area. There are one or two things that can be done or discovered here, but I think that I will weave them into the topics that I will discuss further along, like the companions or the nameless one himself. For now, let's get on with the story. Through all the clues that I gathered, which include a metal portal that the nameless one commissioned and blood of a living descendant of Ravel, I am finally able to enter the labyrinth that the Lady of Pain has banished her to. The labyrinths that the Lady makes are fascinating things. It is a dimensional pocket that has a very specific lock, and the lock seems to be tailored to the one trapped there, and has always one exit. There always is a way to get out, but what that might entail is unknown each time. If a mere mortal is trapped in one of these labyrinths, there is very little chance that he or she will figure out how to escape before dying of starvation or old age. But there are beings that have a nearly unlimited time to figure out how to escape. One such being is Ravel herself, as well as the Nameless One, but we will come back around to that. So now, finally, I will talk with someone that probably can shed some light on the condition of the protagonist, why he keeps forgetting and why he is immortal. The talk with Ravel is another highlight of the story. She is definitely weird, unsettling and without a doubt evil and twisted. So much so that through the whole conversation I had the uncanny feeling that this will with a high degree of certainty, not end well. 
yet it was still casual and friendly enough that I somehow halfway through convinced myself that this is just another conversation with someone that is sympathetic to the nameless one's plight. And I was right, on both accounts. She is a night hack, cruelty is in her very nature, so I knew what to expect as a baseline of behavior. Although, there are some individuals in the planes that can deviate from their set role and alignment, but that happens at a great cost to them. But Ravel is no such being. She will gladly torture and kill if it fits her needs. She did it in the past and has every intention to do it again in the future. But she also helped the Nameless One on his journey. And I mean on this one that the player is currently undertaking. She did lend a helping hand if you stumbled across some certain old woman along the way. These are splinters of Ravel herself, tossed across the plains, her eyes and ears so to speak. But I'm to this day still unsure if these splinters did know that they had a connection to the hawk herself. Because it very much seems that they didn't, although this might be just my imagination. One of such splinters was Mabet, the one that taught me magic this time around. Another one is a dustman in the mortuary that prepares and sews together zombies. She can raise your max HP if you let her. And the third is near Farod's palace and will rummage in the nameless one's entrails to see if anything is hiding there. These parts of the greater whole of Ravel are not strictly evil. What's more, they many times seem to be kind and helpful as in opposition to the main entity. But still, Ravel herself is evil by all meshes, even if she sets some parts of her up to help the hero in his never-ending cycles. And this wicked being is the one that the Nameless One sought out to make him immortal. Yes, it was by the protagonist's very own request that his mortality was to be stripped from him. He flattered the Night Hag, he lied to her and ultimately convinced her to do it. She did it because she became completely infatuated with the hero. In fact, she did not exactly fall in love with him, but rather became obsessed with that weird man standing before her. And when the ritual was done, she immediately killed the Nameless One to see if it worked. It did, but at least partially. He woke back up again, but lost his memories. All the reasons as to why he wanted to be immortal in the first place lost for millennia it would seem. And still unbroken cycle of dying and resurrecting, of remembering and forgetting has begun. A cycle of countless incarnations of the same person living a myriad different lives. Lives that ultimately, instead of helping in what the first incarnation wanted to do, rather put him on the path to discover what that something even was. Truly, a wish granted by a hag is more of a curse than help. She also points the Nameless One in the direction of the Deva called Trias, who is supposed to know how to get the Nameless One's mortality back, or at least where it is hiding. But before she concludes the conversation with the hero, she asks one single question. A question that since became this game's signature question. One that defies torment. That is the impetus for this whole story. What can change the nature of a man? You immediately realize that this is not the first time she asked the nameless one this question. And the amazing thing is that whatever you answer, it will be the correct answer. She even asked this question to other people, but their responses were wrong from the get-go. They simply couldn't have the right answer. Because Ravel is not interested in the truth regarding that question. Not really. What she is after is what this incarnation will answer at this time. What the hero's true thoughts about these questions are this time around. Other people, by the very nature of it, couldn't answer correctly in her mind. Because the answer was not important. The important part was who did the answering. The Nameless One's answer, your answer, was different in many past incarnations and probably will be again if he forgets himself. But that changing perspective and answers are of no consequence to Revel. She is just interested what the Nameless One, what you will say at this moment in time. What do you think the true answer to this question is? And I'm curious if your answer changed by the end of the game or will change if you haven't played it. I know that my did. But after all is concluded, Bravel is not content with letting the hero simply go. She will try to stop and kill him. So after a rather quick fight, I go to the portal and find myself in the city of Cursed. But there is one other revelation that Ravel provides. One that made me reconsider my actions up until now. You see, the Nameless One's immortality isn't free. Sure, there is the fact that he kept forgetting himself time after time condemning him to untold ages of pain and torment. 
But there is another, rather more, well, let's say mechanical cost to that immortality. Each time the protagonist dies, another one somewhere in the plane stays with his or her life so he can be resurrected. Someone utterly random, at an unexpected time, will die in order to fuel the nameless ones not so free right again. But the ones whose lives are snuffed out don't go quietly into the night. They become vengeful shadows that haunt you all the way, even into Ravel's labyrinth. These are creatures whose only mission in life is to kill the nameless one, by the way actually bolstering their ranks if they succeed. But they feel only rage towards him, so there is no other option for them. They missed you at the mortuary, then in Farad's palace, but now they finally caught up to you. And the one thing that they want is to make you suffer for what you did to them. Oh, and they succeeded at that probably more than once, as indicated by some dialogues and even one in-game cutscene. What is interesting, the shadows are not the antagonists of the story. Sure, they haunt you and want you dead, but that isn't even something that they can consciously choose. It's something baked into their nature, and the imperative to find and kill the nameless one is the only reason for their existence. If just for the fact that the nameless one's existence made theirs at all possible. And this one information had an extremely profound impact on me. It made me go back and count how many lives were lost just because I became reliant and even frivolous with the ability of the main character to come back to life time and time again. I was even perfectly willing to die a couple of times during the same conversation just so I might find a few new trinkets left in the nameless one's body. It became a thoughtless thing, something that is obvious and not worth considering. This information made me rethink how I approach things, how many unsuspecting people lost their lives because of me. It was a very weird feeling, so much so that from this point forward I tried my best to heal myself or just run away from a fight if it could result in the protagonist's death. And no, there is no mechanical reward or penalty for doing so, but making me responsible for other people's deaths that I didn't even know made me plenty uncomfortable. So I decided to minimize the collateral damage that the nameless one would inflict. Because he did inflict a lot of pain in this way. Indirectly, that's true, but still. It seems that everything has its price, especially one's immortality. But let's get to the next stage of the adventure and the city of Cursed. And from this moment forward the game becomes much more streamlined, but by no means less interesting. This city is sort of special. It seems to power a prison beneath it, just by the sheer amount of treachery and overall deception that goes on in it. But this is sort of besides the point. The important thing is that the Deva Trias is imprisoned in that very place. And to get to him you have to either go on a fairly long quest, allowing you to gather some more experience and start to hate the people here a bit more, or just go to the junkyard and go down a hole. Apart from the lost levels the difference is non-existent. So I found Trias and freed him. Why he was imprisoned there wasn't a concern of mine. He had the information I needed, so that was how it was going to be. The dev appointed me to someone that could give me more information. And ultimately I ended up by the Pillar of Skulls. It is just like it sounds. A giant pillar made out of animated bony heads that form some sort of hive mind. And they finally tell the nameless one where his mortality hides. That place is called the Fortress of Regrets. And how to get in is only known to... Trias, yes, that Devious Deva knew full well who the Nameless One was and what he was searching for and even how to get there, but he still elected not to tell him. So now I have to find him again. Which isn't that difficult, because he transported the whole city of Cursed away from its original plane so that it could be overrun by monsters. As it turns out, the Deva wants to build an army to storm the heavens. As to why, to make a long story short, he has daddy issues. He did something that made his father burn his wings, so now he wants revenge. But for the nameless one, this is of no consequence. The important thing is that he finally got out of him where the portal to the fortress is and how to activate it. It's in the mortuary, quite literally a few steps away from where the game started. And the key is just, well, regret. The protagonist has to name a regret and he will be able to open the portal. So that's all the information we needed. Now, when it comes to Trias, I always recollect liking this character, but that was mostly on the count of his sprite in game and that he had one of the only two swords in the planes it would seem. Plus, it was a sword with blue flames, a very interesting design. I know it's superficial, but that is how I remember him. 
And I think that this is by far the most scathing remark I could utter about any character in this game. Because apart from that, when it comes to that thematic importance or heft, he didn't leave any lasting impression. Which cannot be said about Ravel, the last opponent or even Farad. Trias seems somehow removed from the themes of this game. Sure, he experienced loss and pain, but in a very real sense, it's outside of the rest of the stories, be it the antagonists or the Nameless One's companions. His hurt simply does not compare to the layers of brokenness of the rest of the cast. He is needed and a very important stepping stone to uncovering the truth about the protagonist. But apart from that, out of all the important characters, he is the one who seems to be standing besides rather than in the center of the story's current, in stark contrast to the rest. Be it as it may, now I have all the information I needed to finish the game and you might think that we are nearing the end of this video. But nothing could be further from the truth, because now it's the time that the Nameless One stumbled upon all available companions. So let's talk about them for a second and then go back to the story. But before that, a small intermission. Please do like, subscribe and share this video if you like it. It helps me out a lot and seeing as the powers of the algorithm don't push my videos that much, any help would be appreciated. Oh, and I do read all your comments and like very much engaging with you, so feel free to leave one below. If you typically don't leave a comment, I would like you to maybe consider leaving one this time around. It is said that 5 words or more makes the Eldritch algorithm happy. And truth be told, I want to see if it bumps up this video a bit, so any help would be mightily appreciated. All companions in the game serve a narrative purpose, and by that I mean that they not only have their own story to tell or discover, but all these stories reflect on the journey that the Nameless One is having. And in many cases they crossed paths before, and the best example of that is Mord, the very first companion who approached me right after the start in the mortuary. He is a rather strange fellow, he is a floating talking head, which as it later turned out was not that strange when it comes to Planescape. But at the start it was a very odd feeling having such a unique party member. Luckily, he is not an outlier, but rather the norm when it comes to companions. He can't use weapons or armor, but you can give him new teeth that will pack a more hefty punch. He has also a rather small frame, well, he is a skull after all. That makes him difficult to hit. In short, this makes him a formidable warrior. But it's his story that is by far more important. You see, he traveled with the Nameless One before, more times than anyone can count. He will not tell you this at the beginning, but with time and some additional clues found in the tomb that was specially made for the Nameless One and once given by Falfon Grace, another of your potential companions, you can slowly get that information out of him. He not only traveled with you before, but in fact the Nameless One himself did pry him from the pillar of skulls that we visited just a while back. Mort promised the protagonist all the information that the pillar possessed if he would just take him out of it. So he did. But the thing is, the information is granted only when the skull is part of the whole. One removed from the hive has just what he has known before his death. He did not lie in this case. He honestly didn't know that this would happen. But he did lie in the past. This is how you get yourself into that pillar, you know. If your lies prove fatal, that will be your ultimate fate. And that is what Moore did when he was still alive. His lies killed someone, and that someone was the Nameless One. This is part of the reason why he wanted to be freed from the pillar by him. To maybe journey with him and in some way right the wrong he did. He is a liar, and the fact that he killed you with his lies a long time ago torments him to this very day. It remains in his mind day after day, binding him to the Nameless One with bonds stronger than any steel or spell. As to why he didn't tell you at the beginning, well, you see, the protagonist wasn't always calm and collected. Many times he tried to kill Mord or throw him back into the pillar, so he decided to err on the side of caution, just in case. But the important thing is that he can be forgiven by the Nameless One, truly forgiven by the person he wronged so long ago. And that forgiveness goes a long way, he will see a friend in you and you will in him. This great but quiet act is so personal and intimate, so important to Mord that he will physically change. Well, this is all in dialogue, but still. Some of the cracks on the skull will mend themselves and take a new shine. He will also gain a large bonus to his stats. The fact that the Nameless One trusts him and forgave him very concretely remade Mord, gave him closure. He is a fantastic character, no doubt about that. But as luck will have it, he isn't the only phenomenal party member that the protagonist can recruit. 
The next companion has also a long history with the Nameless One. Dakon is a Gitzerai. It may sound familiar to you, given the pronounced role that the Gitianki played in Baldur's Gate 3, and that familiarity is not coincidental. They are both basically part of the same race, but adhere to different principles, on account of their first leaders that shaped their people's destiny. The Gitianki were also in Baldur's Gate 2 and Neverwinter Nights 2, as antagonists, and in the latter game a Gitzerai could be part of your team there too. Dakon himself makes an impression of a traveled and tired warrior, someone who has seen too much and lived for far too long. Someone who has lost all purpose in life, but he will offer to travel with you. It would seem that he does so somewhat against his better judgment. And there is a good reason for all these observations, which are by the way spot on. The writers did a great job of conveying this in the opening dialogue. You see, Dakon is in possession of two interesting things. One is the Korak Blade, a sword forged with the Chaos of Limbo, a unique weapon which scales with the level of the Gitzerai. I was always a sucker for such weapons, as I love the idea of improving equipment together with the wearer's experience. But he will not part with that blade, so it is unusable by the main character, and with good reason. The second object is the Unbroken Circle of Zertimon, and both of these are the cause of the Zert's torment. If you ask Dakon if he could teach you something, he will defer to the Unbroken Circle and teach you its lessons, one level at a time. But at some point you will realize that he himself did not discover or understand all the lessons that the Circle holds. So both the Gitzerai and the protagonist embark on a journey of learning and understanding side by side, not knowing that, in fact, you are being taught by one of the previous incarnations of the Nameless One. You see, a long, long time ago, Dakon was the leader of a city in Limbo, a city built basically out of belief. If he believed the walls of the city were strong, they were strong. If he believed that it can't be destroyed, it became undestructible. But if his belief faltered, so would the mortar and the defenses. And that was ultimately his fate. He lost his belief, due to that the city fell and he was left adrift in Limbo. This is where the Nameless One found him, but the protagonist cared little for the lost warrior. What he was after was that blade. But little did he know that the weapon was useless without its wielder, so in order to use the Karak blade he devised a plan how to sharpen Dakon's mind and how to get him his faith back. He forged the unbroken circle of Zertimon, so that Dakon could read it and regain his belief. The Nameless One cared little for the teachings that were inside that circle, but they were curated in such a way so that it would lead the warrior down a path that is most beneficial for the main character. Dakon, grateful for what the protagonist did for him, pledged to follow him as long as that man lived, which was obviously a trap. As you might suspect, Dakon didn't even consider that his savior was in fact immortal, making him effectively a slave for all eternity, or at least as long as the hero was separated from his mortality. The Nameless Man bound yet another creature to him with chains stronger than steel, and making a gift a slave is something that they despise more than anything else. Considering their history, as they were slaves of the Mind Flayer Empire for millennia before they fought their way to freedom. The hero made him obey his words using trickery and underhanded tactics, so he could use him as a weapon. But the current incarnation, you, can complete the circle and guide him to the end of the teachings, and thanks to that help him regain inner peace, giving him a firmer grasp on what he believes in. Sure. The Unbroken Circle was deployed to sharpen Dakon's mind, but it contains real wisdom, knowledge that gave the gift clarity at last. After the inner journey he is no longer tormented by doubt, he doesn't second guess himself and is ready to see the Nameless One's journey to the end as he promised so long ago. What is interesting is that I don't believe that the previous incarnation made up the Unbroken Circle, or at least the contents that are in it, as the teachings seemed familiar to Dakon and were probably genuine but their placement might have been manipulated so that he could come to the right conclusions in due time. One has to admire the work that went into creating such a thing. Well, therein lies a bit more than just a spark of genius. You see, I think that if it was done without any thought, then Dakon would have caught on to the forgery, something that has nothing to do with his people, but instead he looked inside that circle and found what he knew, just placed in such an order as to make him accept Zertimon's teaching that much easier. The previous incarnation might have been evil, or at least opportunistic to the extreme, but he definitely knew what he was doing. Dakon is a fantastic character, with a rich story that draws on the lore of the planes in a major way, and as before it reflects on the journey of the Nameless One. 
the torment of unending slavery, of the fact that by not knowing himself, not knowing what he believes in and who he is, he became a tool for others. But much more importantly, that thanks to this incarnation he regained his faith, by studying the teachings of Zertimon, but much more by the fact that the Nameless One was with him on this journey. Dakon finally found himself. He knows now who he is and what lies before him. He will now help the protagonist come hell or high water, or any other power residing in the plains. Not because he feels compelled to do it as a slave, not even because of Zertimon's teachings, but rather due to the fact that now that he knows himself, he sees the Nameless One's torment and is willing to help him as a friend, as someone he came to value even more than his own life. The third companion is the odd one out. Anna is a tiefling, the first in fact that was portrayed in an ACRPG with the tail and all. She is heir to the king of trash, Farad, a high bar to clear. Don't get me wrong, she does in all respects belong to this setting, to Sigil, but I am not entirely sure if she belongs to this particular story, because her journey really stands out like a sore thumb. It doesn't mean that she's boring, but perhaps on the backdrop of the other stellar companions she appears as rather dull, or plain. In any other game she would be one of the highlights. Simply put, she falls prey to the role that the writers intended for her. And by that I mean she first had to fill a utilitarian role rather than a thematic one, pretty much the inverse of the other companion's writing priorities. And that role is of the typical romance option for the player. And I have to admit that this is something that I didn't even register the first time around. I thought that she had a weird problem with the game's working women, as she reacted strongly whenever the protagonist spoke to a prostitute. During the first playthrough I didn't get what her problem was, only with time it turned out that she developed instant feelings for the Nameless One, and honestly it came out of left field for me. But this is exactly what she is tormented by. She's tormented by the fact that she very much loves the Nameless One, someone that by his very nature cannot love her back as she would want him to. He simply lived too long, for too many times to be even capable of feeling actual love. It's a solid basis for a normal story, as the hurt of an unrequited love can cut very, very deep, causing wounds that for some people never heal. But this romance simply falls flat. Even if Anna herself is a quite interesting character, this kind of love story is already being told with Dionara. By the way, being far more poignant and powerful, so much so, that the hurt and love of the Silver Lady leaves a much more lasting impression. By comparison, the story that Anna was given feels like a teenage crush, rather than something more substantial. This is sadly underwhelming, because they could ditch their love angle entirely and do something similar, like with the next companion. And that is Fall from Grace. She can be the party's cleric, but much more important is the fact that she is a Tanari, a pure form of chaos and evil, a succubus to be exact. And this person founded a brothel in Sigil. Nothing out of the ordinary, you might think. Such an establishment is right up the alley of a succubus. But not in this case. This isn't a typical representation of the industry, but rather a brothel for slating intellectual lusts. Everything that has something to do with furthering someone's intellectual or emotional needs is pursued here, but no physical contact. This isn't something that is written into being a succubus, quite the opposite. For you it might not be a big deal that she founded such an establishment, but for her it most definitely is. You see, if someone is Tanari or Beitizu, they are set in their ways. Their capacity for free will is greatly curtailed. It is in their very nature to fulfill evil deeds, the more the better. Going against that nature is almost unheard of, and that is why Fall From Grace is such a fascinating and fantastic character. She is in tension with the very core of her being. She has a role to play in the planes, a role that the universe quite literally intended for her and bestowed upon her. But she decided that this isn't something that she wants, that this cosmic plan will not define her. She undertook extreme emotional toil to try and become something more than her form dictates. I can't even imagine what it takes for her, each and every day, to struggle against her intended role. The one thing that I can compare it to, to illustrate it a bit better, is if someone is an alcoholic or a substance abuser. And I don't mean to cheapen these horrific experiences, but this is much the same, even if virtual. You can stop drinking alcohol, but each and every day you will struggle not to drink, because you know that you are still an alcoholic and even a single beer or shot could send you spiraling out of control. 
That is what this is. She is in constant battle with herself, a battle that will never end until she dies. Each and every day filled with the torment of standing up and saying, today is not the day that my instincts will win with me. An unending struggle, much like the Nameless One's resurrections. It's not the same thing, true, but she knows that everyday pain, and as the only companion sees the torment of the Nameless One, not as something that happens to some other, but something that she understands deeply and can really sympathize due to her own experience. She is perhaps the most consistently and solidly tormented character in the entire game, barring maybe the Nameless One. But I would say that she's even more hunted than him, because if he achieves what he wants, when he regains his mortality, he can move forward. But Fall From Grace will still be locked in an unending and unavoidable struggle each and every day anew. But there is one companion that doesn't want to show any empathy, not to the Nameless One, not to anyone. There are sometimes people that just want to see the world, or in this case, the planes, burn. And one of those people is Ignis, in the most literal of ways. He is the centerpiece of a tavern, aptly named Under the Burning Man, another tortured soul that knows the Nameless One all too well. He is a mage, and his body serves as a permanent portal to the plane of fire. So he burns with an unending flame, day after day, burned to a crisp but unable to die. Using the decanter of endless water, which activation ward can be found in the lower district, you can help him regain his senses. The endless water and the endless flames cancel each other out. Ignis will still float and burn, but he got back the ability to reason, or rather what he considers as reason. He is patently insane, with a deep love of fire, and I mean deep love, a sort of terrifying fascination, or rather obsession. An obsession that ultimately landed him as part of a tavern's decor for many, many years. Some time ago, he tried to burn down part of the city. The scars of that event can still be seen and walked through. He wanted to burn everything, without regard for human life or suffering. So finally, a group of mages came together to stop the madman. They subdued him, and as form of ironic punishment, they decided to open a portal to the plane of fire through his body. They probably thought that this would be a slight to him, a revenge of sorts. But the most terrifying thing was that it would seem that Ignis welcomed such a form of punishment. Yes, he was rendered catatonic, but reveled in his love for fire. Ignis is not all there in the head, and clearly quite literally consumed by his burning obsession. But he still is a master of magic, and he can teach the Nameless One what he knows. But after asking him about that, he will laugh at you and ask to what end should he do that, when it was the protagonist who taught him all he knows. Yes, it was the main character who was the teacher of Ignis, it was you, who has shown him how powerful magic can be, and you hurt him, and hurt him a lot. True, Ignis is responsible for his actions, and his obsession is his own doing, but it was you who gave him the tools to plunge a whole district of sigil into chaos and suffering. It was you who taught him that pain is a suitable option to achieve one's goals. But he can teach this incarnation new spells, and he will do it gladly, because each spell Ignis will give the Nameless One incurs a hefty price. A price that in a very concrete mechanical way hurt the protagonist. And causing pain to his former master is something that makes Ignis happy. The fact that he can hold the finger of his teacher, burn it to a crisp inflicting unbelievable pain, is something that he will do with glee. But still, the lessons he gives are real, the spells you receive are real. Ignis isn't someone who would deceive, but he is someone who will with all certainty jump at an occasion to hurt his former mentor. Someone who taught him much more than magic, he taught him pain, he taught him resentment. But the mage tormented by his obsession couldn't be further removed from the next companion, one that is calculating in the most concrete of ways. In the clerk's ward, there is a shop where you can buy a strange square doll with wings. This little toy is in the likeness of a Modron, and can be manipulated to open a portal to their maze. Modrons are constructs, beings from the plane of Mechanus. These creatures approach everything using cold hard logic, and mathematical approach if you will. They form a sort of hive mind, or rather they execute the same programs and routines. If you interacted with one Modron, you could say you interacted with all of them. And they set up this maze to study the impulse of living creatures to adventure. Why do people risk their lives inside of a dungeon? What is the purpose of that? To gather experience and loot? So you could gather more experience and loot deeper into the labyrinth? 
That doesn't seem very logical, so it needs to be studied. Thus, the Modron maze. You can take part in that experiment. And if you set the difficulty of the maze too hard, two important things will happen. The first one, you can fight with the most powerful and evil mechanical wizard, who is meant to be the boss of this entire place. And much more importantly, you can find Nordom. Yeah, it isn't hard to see that this character is just Modron spelled backwards. But there is a good reason for that. The plane of Mechanus is part of Limbo. In other words, is Chaos given form, but it still resides on the edges of the plane itself. And if a Modron spends too much time standing and gazing on the nothingness and chaos of Limbo, his connection to the whole will atrophy. It will get weaker and probably severed completely at some point. And so we get Nordon. He lost his connection to the whole. He can now think his own thoughts, act of his own accord, but the one thing he cannot do is go back into the fold of the Modrons. It simply physically and mentally cannot be done. Nordam, for all intents and purposes, is an outcast, severed for all time from his compatriots. He can stand beside them, and there will be no ill will on either side, but he simply cannot connect back to the main program. But you can assume the role of his creative director. And Nordom will carry out any order given. If you tell him to be stronger, more nimble or healthier, he will do just that. He will become what you believe he can be. Your word is law, your belief absolute. If you say that he should be something, then seeing as you are the creative director, Nordorm assumes that this is fact and will change his stats to what is obviously the objective truth. The truth being the words of his supervisor. You. Plus, this is the only companion who can use ranged weapons, not counting Ignis, which can come in handy more times than not. You could say that your belief and order shape what Nordum will become. And unwavering belief is something that the last companion also knows. Truth be told, that is all he knows. While Dakon has lost his faith, the next one is its pure representation. Vylor can be easily missed and is someone who will be most likely left by the wayside, as he is very awkwardly placed. By this time you most likely will have a full party, and to add him you would have to leave someone behind, which most of the time isn't such a big deal, but leaving a companion in this place where you find Vylar is, well, not a wise decision, as you will not be able to go back here and get him or her afterwards. This is a baffling design choice that I do not understand to this day. If there is a way to retrieve the dismissed companion in this place, please do let me know. Vylor is the embodiment of true, unwavering, cruel justice. By his steadfast belief in justice, he became, with the passage of time, the actual avatar of it. So much so that even when his body died, his faith in the ideal kept his spirit alive, animating the armor he was imprisoned in. And you might have already guessed who did that. Yes, the nameless one. After Vylor became aware of the protagonist and his many crimes, he started to hunt him through the plains, coming once or twice close to executing justice. And you must know that he is one of the few characters who could not so much kill the main character as rather destroy him completely, wiping him out of existence. So one of the previous incarnations lured him into a trap, imprisoning him in a cell beneath Cursed, a cell from which he could not escape. He just stood there, god knows how many hundreds of years, waiting. As to why he was imprisoned and not outright destroyed, surely the Nameless One possessed enough power to kill Valor. It seems that the protagonist left him as somewhat of a tool that could be used if pointed in the right direction. After all, he can destroy the Nameless One, and someone such as this can be useful somewhere in the future. He is alive now only because one of the previous incarnations deemed his abilities unique and perhaps handy at some point. By being nothing but belief, a de facto incarnation of an ideal, but without the reason or the self behind it, he became a simple tool whether it be for justice or the Nameless One. You see, the thing about him is that his justice isn't, well, just. It's absolute justice that doesn't look at the circumstances, at whether the crime was actually justified in any way. The important thing for him is that the crime was committed, and crime needs punishment. Actually, his single-mindedness allowed him to become an avatar of blind, uncaring justice. And whether he realizes it or not, Valor can be believed away, if his surety in his morals or his mission wavers, which is all too easy to do for the Nameless One. It seems that belief in on itself can animate a man or even transcend death, that much is true, but it has to be driven by something. The reasoning must be there and it must be a sound one, because if it isn't, 
If it isn't shaped by one's personality, then it can be blown away with the winds of doubt. Doubt that can sink its claws into anyone, as you by this point very well know. Byler is in many regards the mirror image of Dakon. While the Gith lost his faith and the Nameless One helped him regain it, making him stronger, the Mercy Killer is nothing but belief, and if any crack form in that armor, it will lead to his ultimate demise. Without any humanity to represent that justice, to shape it, to make it more palpable and, well, just, the slightest doubt can and will destroy it, as I did many, many times, because I highly dislike the justice that Vylor represents and his rigid adherence to it and the actual atrocities he committed in the guise of dispensing punishment. It is said that he killed many people that would otherwise be found justified by the circumstances and probably acquitted by a court. But as I said it, in Valor's eyes, crime begets punishment. And that is all he knows. People stumble and fall, and Valor is the one that rather than offer a helping hand, he will bring down the axe. So you will forever stay down. And mind you, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be punishment, but it has to be measured. Killing someone isn't always the best choice. Yes, punishment is needed, but it has to be humane. Valor is anything but humane. These were all the companions that can be recruited during the game, and they all are stellar, although some have a bigger thematic connection to the story than others, but that takes nothing away from them. But now it's finally time to go to the mortuary, name a regret, whatever it might be, and step into the fortress, literally built out of them. The first thing, or other person, you see in the fortress is the Onara. She can move freely here as a spectre. That was her purpose, really. She was meant to die here and serve as a guide for the Nameless One. Yet another disposable tool for one of the previous incarnations. But she will help you. Her love is still there, even if bitter now. It really is true love. And if you held on to a ring she left for you all these years ago, she will upgrade it for the last leg of the journey. This is the place where your mortality resides, the transcendent one, a powerful being, one that hates the protagonist with all his might. He detests you, he detests every minute he was in your body and now he hides here, awaiting your arrival. This fortress is chock full with shadows, and rather powerful ones at that. You can fight them as they give a substantial amount of experience, but I always choose to run past them at this point. I was way too eager to get to the next rooms. In one, I fought Ignis, who was recruited by the Transcendent One to destroy the hero. This happens if you have a good character. If you do an evil playthrough, the one trying to stop you will be Vylor. They both possess the ability to erase the Nameless One. So the fact that the enemy had turned them is not that weird. Plus, it serves as a last minute betrayal. But after that, there is the last stop before the grand finale. A place where you can finally talk with three of the more prominent incarnations. You see, through the whole adventure, you came across people who knew the Nameless One and events that he influenced or set in motion. And there are precisely these three that come up time and time again. One could say that they adhere to the prevalent rule of three that is present in Planescape, which basically means that most things come in threes. Three incarnations and three enemies the Nameless One had or still has to stand against. Ravel, Trias and the Transcendent One. But here the rule of three is actually broken somewhat, because there aren't three incarnations, but four. The player is also here. I wonder if this is an oversight on the writer's part or perhaps I'm missing something. Be it as it may, you can of course battle all these incarnations and progress in this way. But fighting in this game always was and will be the boring option. It is way more interesting to talk to them and in this way assimilate them into the unity of the nameless one. First off is the incarnation called the Paranoid One. If there was an instance of senseless slaughter or, well, paranoid actions on the part of your previous incarnations, it was probably due to this guy. He definitely does evil and deranged deeds, but he paradoxically isn't evil in his motivations. Don't get me wrong, he most definitely is a murderous sociopath, but all that stems from what it would seem was fear and confusion. This incarnation woke up like you did to this new life without memories. But on each corner people seemed to know him. The ghost of the Onara lobbed accusations and guilt at him. Shadows were chasing him and he couldn't find reprieve anywhere. This is more than enough to drive anyone insane. It certainly drove him mad. He saw all previous and subsequent incarnations as body snatchers, someone that tries to usurp his right, the right of the one true incarnation to the Nameless One's body. 
It was he who set up traps for the current life of the protagonist, or rather for anyone that came after him. The trap in the sensory stone in the private sensorium was his doing, but there are many more instances of his passing through the planes. In the cleric's ward there is a building where you can rent rooms, and as it turns out, one is paid already in advance by one of the hero's previous lives. And in there you can find a strange cube-like device that can be opened if one avoids the traps that are set up in it. It turns out that this is the journal of the paranoid incarnation, written in a strange language. A language that it would seem is impossible to learn, as the last teacher of it has been killed a while back. But the nameless one can in fact learn this language. That's the language of Uyo. You might remember that back at the beginning of the game, in the catacombs beneath Rockpicker's Square, the protagonist learned the ability to speak with the dead, and using that ability, the long dead teacher, Finnem, can impart to the nameless one what he forgot as during this conversation it also is revealed that it was the hero who killed the scholar. The paranoid one wanted to make it so that only he could read what he had written down, that no other body thief would be able to find out what his thoughts were, or anyone else for that matter. This truly paranoid approach, the tremendous need for secrecy, can be seen in the case of another journal that he left behind. When you irritate the Lady of Pain enough, for example by becoming an acolyte of a god, or playing with a doll that resembles her, she will throw the Nameless One into his very own, specially tailored for him maze. And it seems that the paranoid incarnation was also here, and seeing how erratic his behavior was, him landing in a labyrinth is not that strange. There is one thing you must know about these labyrinths, that the Lady of Pain sends people to. These are single tenant apartments for all intents and purposes. So in this one there was only the nameless one, by the very nature of this place. Sure, someone could wind up here traveling the planes like you did while looking for Ravel, but that requires direct coordinates or a freak accident to make that happen. And in this almost impossible to reach for other people place, he still hid his thoughts as deviously he could. He left a journal here, but it is a ruse. The actual information is hidden inside the bone that makes up its spine or frame. This is the level of paranoia that this incarnation experienced. But for all the evil he conducted, for all the lives he ruined, for all the traps he laid, what he actually was experiencing was fear. Fear that he coped with by directing his frustration outward, to hurt first before anyone could hurt him. But back in this place, in the last room of the Fortress of Regrets, you can talk to him using the language of Uyo. To calm him down, to convince him that you and him are the same person. After all, he's the only one who knows that language. And he will merge with the current incarnation, finally letting go. And the last thing he felt was a sense of relief. Relief that his endless struggle is finally over. That he can rest now and no pursuer will come after him. I must admit that the moment he was about to let go, the description of his changing eyes hit me hard. It was like looking at a lifetime of torment leaving someone's mind. The feeling of a heavy burden being lifted was a very real and personal one for me at that moment. I can understand it well. This is an especially tragic incarnation, but we still have two more to go. Next up is the incarnation that was most sure about what he has to do, the pragmatic incarnation. But that pragmatism isn't something flattering or to be strived for. It's a kind of pragmatism that is opportunistic to the extreme and supremely uncaring for other people. The one thing that matters to this one is achieving his goals. And this is the incarnation that I found the most traces of while traversing the plains. He plucked Mord out of the Pillar of Skulls. He found Dakon and made him a slave. He led Dionara to her death in the Fortress of Regrets. He imprisoned Vylor. And it was probably him that taught Ignis, but that last one is actually unclear. He was also responsible for building a tomb that I stumbled upon under the Rat Picker's Square, and that was supposed to be a trap for the Transcendent One, the Nameless One's lost mortality. Well, that one didn't really pan out. He also convinced Farwood to search for the Bronze Sphere that I had to find at the beginning of the adventure. I was completing an errand that the Practical Incarnation left for Farwood so many years prior. By the way, I backtracked a little and picked up that sphere after I was finished with Trias. The practical one was cruel to the extreme, but never without reason. Senseless slaughter wasn't something that would interest him, but slaughter that would further his goals was something that he would initiate without a moment's hesitation. 
He even wrote a journal in which he meticulously kept every piece of information for himself as well as the next incarnations. Sadly, this treasure trove of knowledge was destroyed by the Paranoid One as it belonged to yet another body snatcher. The practical incarnation used and abused everyone that crossed paths with him. He viewed other people only as tools who had their place in the planes only as long as he found them handy, after which they would be promptly discarded. And somewhat paradoxically, his journey paralleled my own playthrough in surprising ways. I myself rarely play such ruthless characters as that, but it turned out that I viewed my companions in much the same way, albeit with way more compassion. You see, I am not a very big fan of playing an RPG with a team that I have to micromanage. It's too much of a hassle for me. Baldur's Gate 2, both Icewind Dales or even this game, I mostly play solo whenever I can. Plus, in all these games each additional companion steals some of my experience points. And I want all that level juice for myself. So I left all my companions stay where I found them, for the most part. With two exceptions. One, I will add them to the party if they can give me experience. Or two, if they can teach me something, whether it be spells or information. So Fall from Grace was only in the party for as long as I needed to ask her about Mord. After that she was immediately kicked out. Dakon was as long as I needed to finish the Unbroken Circle of Zertimon. Mord was there for the XP boost after learning his pass with the Nameless One. Ignis was there for a time so he could teach me new spells. And Vylor was only added because recruiting him yielded a substantial amount of experience. After that I swiftly convinced him that his perception of justice is flawed and thus his existence has no sense, at which point he collapsed in on himself. As for Anna and Nordum, they weren't even recruited this time around, as their rewards were minimal and I didn't want to bother with them. I inadvertently stepped into the footsteps left by the practical incarnation, leaving my companions as soon as they became useless to me, as soon as they gave me all they could. Sure, I tried to be more compassionate and help however I could, but ultimately my approach was eerily similar to the practical ones. And that made me shiver a bit. It wasn't a flattering comparison or one that I consciously would want, but it turns out that was the approach I took. But it seems that my way worked better and I became stronger than the practical incarnation, so I was able to assimilate him into me due to sheer willpower. And at least my companions weren't strung along to such a dangerous place as the Fortress of Regrets. But that is just an excuse for my actions. My too this time around was very focused on my ultimate goal. That goal being the Nameless One's mortality that was stripped from him. And the last incarnation, the good incarnation, has something to do with that. Or I should rather say the so-called good incarnation, because that good is mightily debatable. Although this guy is definitely very composed and empathetic to the current life, as well as any other. I know very little about him, just the fact that the surfacing of his memories were preceded by a strange tingling in the back of the head. And the fact that it was him who sought out Ravel and convinced her to rip his mortality out of his soul and body. But why did he want such a thing in the first place? It was due to a crime that he committed. A crime so monumentally unforgivable, it is said to have cast a shadow and stained the whole plains. It inflicted a wound that has yet to heal. As a clever twist, we do not get to know what that crime was. Neither you nor the player character knows what it is. But this last incarnation, right beside me, knows. And no, it will never be revealed to you. That is actually genius, because in this way each and every player will fill in what that crime might have been with his or hers own imagination, ensuring that it will always be the most egregious crime one can imagine. So this incarnation sought immortality to right the wrongs that he committed. To try and stave off the cost, he has irrevocably invoked by committing that sin against the planes. And in doing so he lost himself lost his memories and added an unimaginable amount of additional crimes onto his shoulders. He wanted to repent, but all he achieved was to become an unending immortal blight on the plains. But there is one more thing that is connected to this incarnation. He did in fact plan a contingency in the case if he lost his memories. It just never functioned as it should. At least it hasn't functioned up until now. Up until I came to the Fortress of Regrets with the bronze sphere that I took from Firet. It is in fact a sensory stone, a sensory stone from the first incarnation, containing his memories, containing his grief, his regrets, regret that he says had changed his nature. But apart from that, with these memories comes something else, the nameless one's, well, name, 
Something so simple yet so powerful, and no, we do not see or know it, but the protagonist does. And not revealing it is the best decision the devs could make, because every name would be underwhelming. Each choice would ring hollow, each choice would have no connection, no real depth. Besides, the actual name doesn't bear any significance to the player. The only significance it bears is to the player character, an intimate thing, something that at long last makes him whole again. The good incarnation merges with me willingly, so now there is nothing left to do than confront that transcendent one. The named ones lost mortality. This confrontation at the end is phenomenal. You came a long way, you are about to complete the circle to become a whole being again. The only one standing in your way is your mortality, and the amount of endings here is just staggering, or rather ways to achieve the ending. But one could say that this isn't impressive because the end is chosen in the last conversation and not by my actions the whole game through. But such an approach is missing the point entirely. This story isn't about saving the kingdom or city or another obviously flashy and heroic thing. It's a story about one guy finding the truth about himself and coming to grips with what he has done and what he has to do to finally become a complete being yet again. For such a personal quest, these endings are superbly written. For such an intimate journey, they are pitch perfect. The Transcendent One has nothing but contempt for the Named One. He wants him to go away and suffer for all eternity if possible. And you can fight him, there is such an option, but as I already established, in this game, this is the boring option. Then there is the possibility to threaten by holding a knife of pure entropy forged by a golem in the siege tower a while back. This weapon is capable of deleting the hero out of existence. And with him, the transcendent one. The mortality of a man cannot exist if the man doesn't exist, even if separated. Then you can use the name you just learned to convince your mortality to return to you. He doesn't know his name, he has forgotten it or never known to begin with. So how can he claim to be separate from you, yet better, if you know more about both of you than he does? It's obvious that he doesn't know himself as you do, and your separation is artificial and unnatural, so the only logical course of action is to become whole again. And finally, there is the ending in which you pose the game's most important question back to your mortality. What can change the nature of a man? You answered that question differently many times before, and the transcendent one doesn't know the answer either, but through the whole game it became painfully obvious what really can change the nature of a man. And no, it isn't regret, it's belief. It's belief that can change the nature of a man. That same belief that once strengthened the walls of Dakon city, and the lack thereof spelled its doom. Belief that someone has forgiven you, that makes you stronger and more whole. Believe that a small seed can sprout if you concentrate enough. Believe that someone can stop existing if he himself loses the conviction that his existence has sense. And finally, believe that a simple ghost is something more than just part of a whole. Throughout the whole game it was shown that a strong belief is capable of anything, that it can achieve miracles or acts of unspeakable terror. This is the fundamental truth of this whole game that belief accounts for everything, and in the planes it is everything. If you believe that your mortality cannot be separate from you forceful enough, then there is nothing that can say otherwise. Whatever ending you choose, you will be thrown down into the hells to fight in the unending blood wars. And when I first played this game as a teenager, I didn't get this ending. It was far, far later I realized that for him this was way better than what he had endured up until now. Release at last. These were his first steps taken as a whole person since untold millennia of suffering, of being broken. He looks onto the battlefield and knows that any horror he might find there is nothing compared to what he has gone through. He is whole now. And an unending conflict is the punishment he incurred, deserved and ultimately is fully willing to pay now. Now that he knows everything that there is to know about himself. Now that he is one with his mortality. That debt must and will be settled at last. This story is special, from the very beginning to the very end. The themes that it touched upon were something that I never have seen in any game before, and even to this day it is extremely difficult to find such an introspective and intimate story. No other game had pulled me in so much and forced me to start asking questions beyond the fact of what to do to progress a little bit further. 
Planescape Torment made a fantastic job of making me consider other things than just the game I was playing. It posed questions that went far beyond the narrative of the story, and up until that point no other game has done that for me. This is without a doubt one of my favorites, and I'm extremely grateful that I could share this with you. But before I end this video, I have two announcements to make. One, I will try and keep the community tab on my YouTube channel up to date as to what my new project will be and how it is going. And two, I set up a Twitter or X account. You can catch me there, the link will be in the description. This is all I have for you this time. Thank you for holding out this long. And maybe we will see us in the next in-depth look.